Hi, I'm David Manti, and welcome to a new episode of the Today in Manufacturing podcast. Every week, we take the five most popular stories on our websites and discuss the implications they have on the industry. Before we get started, please make sure to like, share, and subscribe to the podcast. You can also help us out a lot by leaving the podcast a positive review on whatever platform you use. If you want to email the podcast, you can reach any of us at Jeff, David, or Anna at IEN.com with email the podcast in the subject line. We're also live every Thursday on YouTube at IEN Magazine. So subscribe. So so you can get a notification and you can join us live. Jeff, how are you doing this week? Excellent, David. How about yourself? I am doing well as well, despite the tremendous snowfall that we seem to be in the midst of receiving. Yeah, we're in the eye of the storm right now, I think, like right between two big hits. Yeah, we're in it. Uh, we're right at that time where all <laughs> the emails and texts are coming out. Is that what you're getting right now, Anna? Just like, hey, we're not canceling anything yet, but keep your app open. Oh, I'm waiting for the moment. It's going to happen, I think. We made it two and a half hours later than a couple days ago. So uh, that's given me like a real sense of like just false confidence where I'm just like, oh, it's going to be fine. Everyone's going to school tomorrow. I'm going to work tomorrow. Barely going to snow. That's going to happen, right? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. It's good to have one optimist on the panel. Can't trust those crooks at the meteorology store so so you don't trust weather forecasters never or the 401k program no not at all my goodness a bunch of crooks if i'm sitting down at a poker table and there's someone that runs 401k and a meteorologist i immediately leave liars they've won already they have won already they fooled us all anywho let's not jump into our first story man they are just crooked though no <laughs> that's really got you fired up david yeah. is totally distracted now no, it's like <clears throat> for another day, for another podcast, it is for, for another a final day. thought. I'll write it down right now. All right. <clears throat> Let's get a word from our sponsor in here before we jump into our first story. To build a scalable maintenance. Uh, what are we building? Oh, to build a scalable maintenance function into today's market, organizations need to drive increased output from their equipment and their facilities with fewer resources. But there's one problem. Dun, dun, dun. Maintenance 1.0 needs to evolve. So join us Thursday, January 25th at 1 p.m. Eastern for Building Your 2024 Maintenance Program. Four key principles to boost uptime now and for the future. Learn which maintenance strategies you can leverage to boost uptime and why software data and technology are essential to the future of maintenance. Also note that if you would like to sponsor the Today in manufacturing podcast you can reach any one of us jeff david or anna at in.com with sponsor the podcast in the subject line and we'll get you guys helped out and give you two incredible reads maybe in a pre-roll just like a whole package of goodies in the today in manufacturing podcast how about a video submit a video then we get like a 25 second breather just to like take deep breaths yeah nice. those the videos are nice but david We're just like, loves doing these reads mm -hmm, loves mm -hmm. them. but that actually like gives me a minute to breathe after like the height. Like right now I'm super keyed up because you mentioned like the two hottest of buttons, the 401k and meteorologist. <laughs> and I'm just like, oh, 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 okay. And where if we had like a 25 second video, I could have taken like three or four breaths, finished my cup of coffee and been okay. I'm sure Alex's eardrums would also be grateful. <laughs> yeah. No, that's the 401k of all things. Mm -hmm. Of all the buttons and knobs. All he's right. going to, He's got to keep a hot one on that volume on my mic. I apologize all the time. I do. I do. And if I don't, I need to apologize more. I'm sorry. All right. Our first story this week. Inside look. The carbon composite fiber fuselage that burned on a Tokyo runway. Is the material safe? On January 2nd, a Japan Airlines flight carrying 379 passengers and crew landed right behind a Coast Guard aircraft preparing to take off on the same runway. The aircraft collided and both were engulfed in flames. Safety experts praised the airline's crew for getting everybody out of the burning jetliner, but five crew members on the Coast Guard craft died in the collision. The jetliner's fuselage was made from carbon composite fibers, and the accident is renewing concern about the challenges of putting out fires involving the material. Conventional airplane, <clears throat> conventional airplane fuselages are made from aluminum. Composite materials are about 20% lighter than aluminum, which is huge when it comes to fuel savings. But when they catch fire, the fumes are also very toxic. 
In this case, the fuselage actually protected passengers from the fire as it didn't burn through right away. According to John Goglia, a former member of the NTSB, there is no real-world evidence on whether composites are any better or worse than aluminum at resisting fire and heat. Since the 1990s, the FAA has said that the main health hazards from composites in plane crashes and fires are sharp splinters from exposed material, fibrous dust, and these toxic gases generated from burning resins. Todd Curtis, who is a former Boeing engineer, said, quote, putting out the fire took much more effort than with a typical airliner fire. He contends that composite materials provide fuel for the fire. Jeff, is this what, you know, we talk about this issue with EVs a lot, right? Where there is a new training that needs to happen. You know, with all new technologies, you got to think of every aspect of it. With EVs, it's how do you put out an EV that's in a runaway thermal event? Is this something that maybe every EMT and firefighter should have been trained on long ago as to like how to, the differences of putting out a fire when it's a carbon composite fire? Well, I think we're still learning more about the fire itself. Okay, mm-hmm. there was another plane involved here that was probably more responsible for what happened than than this particular airliner. Okay, yeah. it was it was hit by a Coast Guard um, aircraft as well. So, I think, but I think when we get back to the carbon materials here, there's always going to be trade offs when you start using advanced technologies. Mm-hmm. I think there's a parallel. You know, it, not that it's completely the same, but we've got bad weather going on. There are going to be car accidents. Now, we don't want anything looking like what happened on the runway here in Tokyo, yeah. obviously. But it made me think about how cars have evolved over time as well. We have given up um, more powerful vehicles in in the name of fuel efficiency. And as a result, they've also become much lighter. Mm-hmm. Okay, they can, They're can much quicker in terms of a 0 to 60 times. So there is the possibility for more accidents there. And if you're in an accident your car is probably totaled. Now, we've become better at protecting passengers. Yeah. But the reality is with the way cars are made now versus even 25, 30 years ago, they're done, especially if the airbag deploys. Mm -hmm. And we do give up some of those or sacrifice some of those different dynamics in the name of being more fuel efficient and better performance. And that's what we see here on the aviation side of things. We've given up some of the more durable elements of those aircraft to make them lighter, more fuel efficient, more environmentally friendly, reduce emissions, all of those things. And I think in this instance, while it's easy to look at the materials and the fact that it was this very spectacular fire, we're forgetting about a lot of the other benefits that were that we have realized over time. Mm-hmm. Plus, we don't know that this wouldn't have been just as bad a fire if it was an aluminum or some sort of metal shell. Mm-hmm. I'd also point out that all of those safety parameters that they put in place in the design element of this plane worked. Yeah. All of those passengers were able to get out. There were no fatalities from that plane. The fatalities were from the Coast Guard aircraft again that struck it. Yeah. So I I I think we're going to learn more here. And I think actually the carbon materials are going to be more vindicated than anything else once we learn a little bit more. The one thing that immediately came to mind for me as well when we look at a lot of these composites is that's the material we're using a lot of 3D printing processes. And I really hope there isn't some some sort of bleed over into looking at those in a different light uh, because there's a lot of benefits that we're also seeing from 3D printing specific even to aviation and aircraft design, using them for different parts, different segments to help, again, make the aircraft lighter, reduce fuel usage, re- reduce emissions. Mm-hmm. So I, I think there's a lot here that we're going to learn. And at the end of the day, I still think it's more a human issue in this instance than it was the materials that were in play. Well, I think that was – I, th- I think the answer was simple. Like, uh, you know, it asks the question, is this material safe? And based off of all the initial findings they have in the investigation, I would say yes. Yeah. I mean. As safe as we can be. I mean. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, and a couple of things that they had uh, mentioned in the article, one in particular that stood out to me is that, you know, um, everyone was able to be evacuated safely in the Japan Airlines. You know, they credited the crew with getting everybody off the plane safely. I was, I was 380 passengers Mm -hmm. and uh, we know how much of a cluster it can be when everything's going fine. Oh yeah. uh, Let alone it's engulfed in two fires. (laughs) Um, So I don't know. That was my biggest takeaway from this article is that yes, uh, it is safe, um, but different. Is that how you kind of took it or did you have a different angle on it? Yeah. I mean, I think that uh, you both raise a a lot of really good points. Um, You know, Jeff, 
your points about fuel efficiency, I agree. There's definitely some trade-offs in terms of how the these types of designs and materials evolve, what you kind of give up in exchange for that. But, um, and, you know, if you look at the trend here in aviation, like Boeing has also put a lot of emphasis on this material as well. This was a, an Airbus plane, but Boeing um, also has been using this uh, in their 737s, I believe. Well, yeah, and uh, yeah, and they uh, they started everything in 2011 with the 787s. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Seven, yeah, 787, that's the one. Um, and it's not just because of the fuel saving and the lighter weights, but they also um, are said to be less susceptible to fatigue, which reduces the amount of maintenance that they need. Mm-hmm. And so- you know, it stands to reason, I guess, that you could suggest maybe that uh, reduced fatigue has served some sort of preventative role here. So, it, you know, it's, of course, tough to pinpoint any um, offset in incidents that may have occurred based on that also. Yeah. But, you know, it could be serving a, a, a purpose there as well and making these planes a little bit safer as well. Um, so this A350 is more than 50 percent composite materials by weight. According to Reuters, experts say that it's too early for full takeaways, but the fact that all passengers and crew evacuated safely while the structure was intact uh, may renew confidence in the materials, which were certified with special conditions. Um, I don't know if I agree with that necessarily, because those images of the fireball <laughs> and the like absolute roaring fire, like yeah. those were that was intense. Like, yeah, yeah I mean, you guys saw them. Yeah, there is nothing left. <clears throat> No, there's nothing like there's the wings. Yeah, there's nothing left of that plane. And when you consider that this was a runway crash, uh, that's something I think as a consumer that I think of as being survivable. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And, you know, and this footage of the plane getting absolutely incinerated feels like kind of a near miss um, more so than a plane that is designed for survivability. I don't know if like the verbiage that they're using or I don't know if like the the insinuation that this is going to renew confidence in the material. I don't know if that's true. Do, do I think that that's fair? Yes, I do. I think that it should renew confidence in the material, but will it? I don't know, based on on the footage, you know, because like to me, design for survivability is an airbag. It's not a fireball before you've come to a stop and people running hunched over out of the plane with their faces covered because of the toxic black smoke. Yeah. I mean, that was a very, it was very close to not being zero fatalities. Very close. Yeah. Um, I don't think that that is a positive visual. So I don't know. I'm not saying that I think that it's not a safe material. I'm I'm saying that that this the coverage of this may encourage that type of perception that this is not a safe material. When I think we know that it, that it, as they said, there's no concrete evidence that this is any more susceptible to fire than anything else. But right. but you know, as a consumer who doesn't know anything about aviation, seeing this that may may make you think twice about it. I don't know. I think that right now in aviation, you'd think twice more about getting on a 737 max jet than uh, about getting on a composite aircraft. Um, How can't you um, do both? Well, I, <laughs> mean, do both? Sure. I mean, uh, it might be one of those things where you just wind up with a bunch of scared people Googling their aircraft before they get on them and uh, just making uh, the experience at the airports Filled with even more anxiety, which is what we need. Right. I know. And I like, you know, fair or not, I'm not saying I'm just saying that like it's there's potential for people to look at this and be like, that's not (laughs) that's not like a good outcome, in my opinion, is like looking at that plane on fire. Right. No, it's uh, the optics are bad. The optics are bad. Yeah. Um, Bar tabs at airport bars are skyrocketing. Um, I, I think one thing, one thread to really follow with this is the, um, you know, because it's on the investigators and the regulators to follow up with the passengers and firefighters to see if they are injured or have any lingering uh, problems as a result of the exposure to the toxic smoke. I think that stands to have a bigger impact on it than uh, the fireball. Because, like, um, the toxic, because, I mean, how many times have we seen some sort of catastrophic event? Everybody makes it out okay. But it's, you know, the dust or the contaminants in the air that wound up having a greater impact. And I mean, I think that could that could change the minds as well, just because it's one thing to be protected by a carbon composite shell. It's another that, OK, you are protected. Uh, no one burst into flames, but you can't control the reaction. I understand that. And I think we're all basically saying the same thing. Yeah. But when then you get to the second part of that conversation, which is, okay, if you don't want this, what do you want? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's the other solution? If the other solution prevents just as many challenges in different ways, 
Yeah. This is still the better route to I go. I agree. Yeah. I mean, that's where, and I know it's difficult to have that conversation with some people because they just want to react and get all fired up about stuff, like David to a 401k program oh, administrator or something. Started it. But yeah. yeah, you still have to have that second part. And that's where I think a lot more clarity comes in. Well, and I think when you're so close to an event like this, you don't want to say things like the cost of progress. Um, but it's a reality of the situation. Um, one thing that kind of stood out to me, um, and I don't know if you guys caught this as well, but how it said that aircraft manufacturers are supposed to show that planes can be evacuated in 90 seconds with half of the exits blocked. Yeah. And then there was the interesting part where people said that there's some question as to the accuracy of these U.S. government run tests. I didn't know how they just dropped that kernel in there yeah. and then didn't follow up with anything else. No source link, just yeah. Yeah. some question. Like yeah. that's like. Does that mean the writer? Does that mean I like. Think that means the writer basically is like, yeah. well, there's room for interpretation on that, I'm sure. Yeah, it's just like what you saw a test and you're like, well, it was 91 seconds. I need a little bit more there, and I couldn't find anything else in the limited time I had available. <clears throat> All right. Our next most popular story this week. Ship sinks after crew attempts to fix autopilot while underway. In October 2022, the MSC Rita container ship was traveling southbound in the Atlantic when the Tremont, a fishing, fishing vessel, slammed into it. The Tremont sank, and the crew of 13 were all forced to abandon ship. They were rescued by Good Samaritan ships and a Coast Guard helicopter. The accident caused more than $6 million in damages, and the NTSB last week determined the accident was caused by some untimely maintenance and lack of a proper lookout. The NTSB pinned the blame on the Tremont because one of the ship's mates admitted that he was trying to fix the gyro compass while the autopilot was engaged. But the autopilot kind of really needs that gyro compass. The autopilot relies on the heading information from that gyro compass, so adjusting it while underway caused the Tremont to make an erratic turn into the side of the MSC Rita. The NTSB says, quote, Managing simultaneous operations is an essential element of safety management and safe vessel operation. Before beginning work, mariners should identify hazards associated with working on one piece of equipment that might affect another, such as sensors, feeding information to other inf uh, these sensors that are feeding information to other equipment, and manage those risks to avoid unsafe conditions. Now, Jeff, I chose this quote to end this story with in particular, because it just seemed like it really was had a lot that could translate to the manufacturing industry uh, in terms of, you know, making sure that what you're working, realizing the implications of what you're doing in the moment and how that might have a ripple effect on other equipment operations or other things down the line. Well, in this instance, it's not just the direct impact. There's also the periphery as well, because I think when you look at one thing that was, not a big part of this story, but I think is worth investigating is this ship was the, the Tremont was coming home with half a million pounds of squid. Yeah. So Whoa. What that tells you is it was carrying tens of millions of dollars of cargo. Forget what it is. Yeah. In the current day and age, we're still dealing with supply chain shortages. When it comes to food, we're dealing with huge price increases and great demand for product. So when you put those things into perspective and we continue to talk about more and more of these maritime incidents, it kind of tells you why. Mm -hmm. Now, overall, when you look at right, all the stats that I could find, the number of these types of um, accidents, um, stuff, people, ships colliding, all that, they've actually gone down in recent years. Mm -hmm. But we're hearing about them more, and they're getting more attention because they play such a vital part in the supply chain. Yeah. And in this instance, I'm sure you had these fishermen out there saying, we got a full boat. We got everything we need here. Let's get home because the sooner get we get, get there, exactly. Yeah. And there's all that pressure that comes <laughs> not just from their suppliers, but just from the general public. You and I, yeah. we are used to getting stuff now, and I yeah. want it at a better price, and I want it as soon as possible. That's all playing a part into a lot of these incidents because we're seeing people focus more on timeliness and getting things done as opposed to potentially doing it the right way. Mm -hmm. When you look at the NTSB report, and I don't know if we can throw this up on the screen, but there is a graphic here that shows the routes of the ships. Yeah. And you see the MSC Rita, it's on almost a straight line. Yeah. And you see the Tremont going away from it. And as you indicated when you're doing the recap, takes a right turn yeah. right into it. I or mean, excuse me, a left turn. Or no, right no, turn right, right, right like, into it. Yeah, like erratic 
erratic. I mean, it, it doesn't is, like spell it out enough. It just, I mean, it doesn't even, it turns on a dime. It's going completely, what it, is that, like north, northwest. Yeah. And then they start uh, messing with the gyro compass and it takes a hard right right into the MSC. Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt about it. And I think the other thing there is in addition to all the supply chain pressures, as much as we love technology, look out the window. Yeah. Like, oh, I know. Pay attention here. Yeah. We're in the Atlantic Ocean. There is enough room. These ships were miles apart when they started talking to each other. Yeah. There was room to not be so reliant on technology and just pay attention to your environment and look at what's going on. Yeah. Well, I think that was one of the interesting parts of this story, right, is that it is something as advanced as autopilot on a ship and a lookout. You know, like having yeah. a proper lookout, which is just like the first safety measure ever on a boat, which is somebody watching yeah. and the latest in terms of autopilot, which I mean, Anna, when we look at the future of um, shipping overseas, we're talking a lot about autonomous ships. And I guess maybe when we put all of our eggs into that basket, we got to make sure that it works. I guess maybe part of the saving grace is that. It was human error that caused autopilot to fail in this situation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, it, it like I read a little bit more about the the specifics of the incident as it was happening, and um, it appears as if it were a pretty scary scenario, um, all things considered. Yeah. So you mentioned a lookout, the need for a lookout, and yes, they should have looked, but this actually took place in the middle of the night. It was very dark when it happened. So obviously the ship that they ran into probably was lit, but mm-hmm. um, but at the same time they also did not have great visibility. But that's what's scarier um, about this report because they talked about how the call for help uh, that they uh, issued came in about one o'clock in the morning um, as the tree mount was taking on water and starting to sink. So think about how terrifying that would be if you're on that boat. You can, yeah. It's black black everywhere. They're sixty miles off the coast. Um, there was a child on the boat also yeah. <laughs> who was rescued. Um, they they uh, hopped on some life rafts that were provided by a ship called the Atlantis that was eight miles away and kind of swooped in to help uh, with the rescue efforts. The captain stayed with the vessel until at the absolute last minute he was hoisted out with a basket, but they said it was just mere moments before the vessel sank. So mm-hmm. um, it would, truly was an emergency, um, and based on the... Description of this dramatic rescue could have gone the other way pretty easily. Yeah. Um, and I just want to mention too this the ship, the Atlantis. Um, the fact that it was even there is nothing short of a miracle because mm-hmm. it's a research ship. Yeah. yeah. So it was yeah. like you know it, it it this is the Good Samaritan ship that they're referring to, but it it, it was on a three week mission. Um, conducting research dives on seeps of methane gas from the ocean floor. It's using some technology that they use to study the wreck site from the Titanic. Mm-hmm. So, like, interesting. Definitely not just like your standard, yeah. like, uh, you know, container ship that's like cruising through the area. This is a ship that was there completely by happenstance and actually d- did the lion's share of the rescue effort with their um, boats, and they made it a huge impact on making sure these people, I think, survived. So, um, when you look at the maintenance procedure that was taking place here, which like frankly seems like such a bonehead move to employ when you're, you know, operating considering the circumstances and it's pitch black out. And yeah, just kind like, of flying blind. Yeah, like w- kind of what are you doing? Uh, it could have very easily been 13 fatalities behind it. Yeah. So um, the whole situation, again, like, you know, you mentioned we, we, we talk about these all the time. And I think people are interested in them because you think like, why isn't this... Uh, why is this happening? Like, mm-hmm. you know, just same when you, you see a safety incident in a factory and you think like that seems like such common sense. Why did it go down that way? Um, and I think just reinforcing that these issues continue to occur is important because you have to draw attention to the fact that sometimes people are just making bad decisions based on maybe fatigue or lack of training or what have you, um, they've just been doing it for too long that they kind of zone out on the the actual real risks that are surrounding that operation. And you can't take a sleeper on this kind of stuff. No, and I mean, you're right in terms of that. And I can really relate to this because I have a problem with it too, where it's like, there's a problem. You have crazy tunnel vision mm-hmm. as to solving that problem. And so you're su- hyper-focused on fixing the problem without really sussing out all the details. And uh, so I'm, I'm sure there was some issue. I um, I didn't catch it in the report, 
as to why he was fixing the auto compass. Um, but you know, just like, Oh, something's wrong. I'm going to go fix it and it'll be fine. And not even thinking like, Oh, we're using this and heavily, heavily reliant on it as well. Anna, you talked about how close it got to being, um, even more serious. I mean, after they collided, both ships kind of contacted each other. And it was like the, the equivalent of like, when you run into somebody on the street where it's like, you good? I'm good. You're good. And then like, they both kind of told each other like, yeah, we're fine. And it wasn't until they kind of both went their separate ways that all of a sudden the Tremont was like, oh no, we're taking on water. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, and, uh, as results, like maybe they could have investigated a little bit more because the MSC had already kept going about its business and was far enough, you know, was pretty far away once the Tremont needed help. Um, so the damages to the vessels, like I said, was $6 million. Jeff, you mentioned, I didn't know that it was squid, but it is like 500,000 pounds of fish mm -hmm. This that was worth some $750,000. And you talk about all the supply chain, supply chain pressures. There's also pressures at home, right? Like yeah. uh, they need to get home, get paid and take care of their families as well. Um, and you just can't rush these things. Uh, another part that is also crazy that it wasn't worse it was the difference in size, right? Mm -hmm. It is staggering. The Tremont was a 115 foot vessel that was actually built by Bay Shipbuilding in Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin. So in 1970, Tremont Fisheries bought this boat in 2017. So it's an old, it's an old vessel. And, it, you know, bringing up a couple of issues that we often talk about, about like problems maintaining old equipment. One thing that we haven't mentioned yet was that the Tremont was kind of chastised for using an out-of-date VHF system to signal for help. I mean, basically, uh, it's supposed to be much more sophisticated where when you give out a Mayday call, it kind of pinpoints where you are. Um, this one, they kind of just knew that someone was issuing a Mayday. They didn't know where they were. Um, you know, these digital mo or these modern systems have digital selective calling that alerts search and rescue authorities with nearby vessels and automatically provides the vessel's position with just a push of a button. They didn't have that. So mm -hmm. a lot of times, Jeff, you know, you talk about when people are looking at costs, right? Like, uh, I'm, as you mentioned, I'm sure margins are very slim. When you're looking at upgrading a piece of equipment like this, you don't, I mean, you, you know how it could be life-saving, but you also make the choice not to upgrade that type of equipment. Yeah, I mean, and I think cost probably definitely came into play here. Like you said, it's an older bolt, probably an old, older operation facing a lot of pricing pressures. The one thing I wanted to get back to, though, is when you're operating a 110, 120-foot boat in the middle of the ocean at night, you can't have tunnel vision on things you're doing. Yeah. I mean, that has to be ingrained. I, I don't want that to sound as some sort of like let them off the hook type of personality conflict or or defect that yeah. that sort of makes this I don't think anyone's understand saying no, I don't think I mean, anyone's saying that. No. You can't you can't have tunnel vision in that no, situation. But I mean I you can't but I mean it's also like it's you're you're one of thirteen or you're one of twelve, uh giving the uh, capabilities of the child on board. Um, you know, which is why you need like one of the other twelve or eleven to be your lookout. You know, it's yeah. your crew, your team. Like, even though if it is in the middle of the night, uh, and just again, the staggering differences, 115 foot Tremont, the, uh, MSC Rita is a Panamanian flagged container ship that is 1,066 feet long. So it is incredible that this accident wasn't more severe. Basically considering that this little vessel T-boned it in the middle of the ocean. Um, they're based out of, uh, so it's operated by a Mediterranean shipping company, which is based out of Italy. Um, one of the things that also stood out is that it did leak 31,000 gallons of diesel fuel that was spilled into the Atlantic. And that environmental damage was described as small. <laughs> just a uh, cute, just a cute little oil spill. A cute amount of, a cute amount of diesel fuel in the ocean. But I mean, again, it was great that, uh, Nobody was injured. Everybody was rescued and that there was a good Samaritan vessel close by. But man, when you're performing maintenance, just think about the implications of your actions. All right. Our next most popular story this week. Boeing jetliner that suffered in-flight blowout was restricted. The Boeing jetliner behind the infamous in-flight blowout over Oregon <clears throat> couldn't fly to Hawaii because... On three different flights, a warning light indicated a potential pressurization problem. Alaska Airlines restricted the aircraft from long flights over water so the plane, quote, could return very quickly to an airport. 
That's pretty bad. Jennifer Hammondy, chair of the NTSB, said the pressurization light might be unrelated to last week's accident. On Friday, the plug might be unrelated. Um, on Friday, plug, uh, the plug covering an unused exit door blew off of a Boeing 737 MAX 9 when it was about three miles over the state. The warning light came on <clears throat> on December 7th, January 3rd, and January 4th. The accident happened January 5th. Again, maybe it's not related. The lost door plug was found Sunday near Portland, Oregon, in someone's backyard. Now, it's on to investigators to figure out how the plug, which is a 26 by 48 inch plug, about, uh, which is just not the size of a traditional plug that you think of, and weighs about 63 pounds, investigators got to figure out how this thing broke free. The FAA grounded 171 of the 218 MAX 9 that are Max 9s that are currently in operation. And Anna, we mentioned this so many times when things get grounded, but you just got to be really skeptical of the other 40 or so that are still in service. <laughs> I, yeah, I guess. <laughs> uh, Jennifer Homedy says that the light came on during a flight on January 3rd and on January 4th after the plane had landed. Alaska ordered additional maintenance to look at the light, but it was not completed before Friday's incident. Mm -hmm. I'm struggling a bit here with the responsibility part. Yeah. Um, because as this report details, Boeing's stock plummeted immediately after the planes were grounded. So did uh, Spirit Aero Systems, uh, their key supplier. But when you look at what Hamadi says here about the warning light, it seems to me that it was a calculated risk that was employed by the airline to continue to fly this plane, mm -hmm. albeit in restricted capacity without properly exploring this warning. Yeah. Which as a, uh, you know, a consumer, a flying public, like that's alarming to me. Um, and what concerns me further uh, is obviously the airline felt that they needed the uptime, I think, of this craft and that the risk was low enough to continue to fly it, just not over water. Yeah. <laughs> uh, which means that their fleet is optimized maybe to a degree... Um, that's uncomfortable, where they don't have maybe enough room. Mm -hmm. um, consider the fact that Alaska Airlines, which is um, an all Boeing fleet, has um, had had plans in place to expand their fleet. And then they announced in October that they'd instead be scaling that plan back because uh, they wanted to address some projections of a slight softening in demand for 2024. But... You know, observationally, I, I don't think we're there yet in that softening of demand. Um, <laughs> industry lobby group Airlines for America said that 2.8 million passengers flew each day during the holiday rush, representing a 16 percent increase in the number of holiday flyers over 2022. Um, was this plane in service against the better judgment of the airline? W like, was this a roll of the dice to even put that plane out there? To me, it feels like it was. And unfortunately, um, Boeing is going to pay a tremendous cost for this. And maybe it's their fault. Maybe it's their technology and it's a mm -hmm. design flaw and they should be held to the fire for this. But at the same time, maybe that plane also should not have ever taken off because if you have a warning light going off twice and you just kind of decide that that's not important enough to pursue whatever that warning is, mm -hmm. then to me, that's really on the airline. Yeah. No, that's what is crazy to me, right? Where it's just like, Oh, so this thing is, so we shouldn't fly this until we check it out. Oh, no, you can fly it. Where are you taking it? Over water? No, don't take it over water. My God, just keep it over land. It's fine. It's fine. It should be fine. I think all of those details are just a really bad look on Alaska Airlines. And I mean, really, part of it that's kind of saving them, I think, in terms of uh, exposure on this accident is the fact that it's a MAX 9. You know, like, I think if it's a different aircraft, if it's one that doesn't have an already troubled past, um, that the spotlight might be on Alaska Airlines a little bit more versus Boeing. Maybe. Well, Alaska Airlines is kind of a regional airport airline. I mean, not much here in the Midwest yeah. uh, as far as Alaska goes. So I think you're right there. Boeing's a bigger target. There's shared responsibility here amongst all three of these players, though, when it comes to Spirit, Boeing, and Alaska. Yeah. Um, the fact, I agree with, with Anna, the fact that they let these flight, these planes get off the ground, it, it just kind of blows your mind. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to understand. The only thing you can see creeping in here is a lot of the um, 
the airlines are still trying to recoup from everything they lost during the pandemic. So you can see now that they've got full flights. They're charging more for them. That has to be creeping into the mindset, unfortunately. That's the only thing that you could think of that would make this continue to, to go. What In looking at this story, though, it, it kind of brought me back to Boeing. And what kind of, what is going on here? I mm-hmm. mean, how can this continue to be just this ongoing issue? It's just one thing after another, really since 2018. Since they had the two go down, they've had other incidents. This is just the most recent. The only thing I can think of is it's just some serious hubris on their part. When you look at who supplies these planes, it's basically them and Airbus. Yeah. Where are you going to go? And the other thing is, you know, and this is from CNN, they had one of their best years ever in 2013, or excuse me, 2023. They had over 1,300 orders, which is their best year since 2014. So when you look at the fact that they're still selling a lot of planes, they're probably thinking, hey, can we just move past this without really addressing the issue? Mm-hmm. That feels like what, what what's going on here. And that has to go all the way back to spirit in terms of what they are or are not doing when they're assembling these planes. I mean, for things for screws to or for bolts to be unloosened, for them to be missing nuts and other things like that. I mean, that's blocking and tackling stuff, right? Yeah. That they're obviously not doing. <laughs> and the only reason, again, that I can think back is they don't feel the pressure somehow, which yeah. is hard to imagine. Um, the other thing I think that is interesting here, though, when you look at Boeing, while they did have a very good year on the commercial front, their defense business lost money. Because when you get all these contracts that far out, if the technology advances, if you've got other things going on, you lose money. Mm-hmm. In two, 2023, they lost almost $2 billion on their defense side of their business. Now, I don't know, $2 billion, that seems like a lot. And if you've got things going on in the other side of your business that's sort of floating everything, and that's starting to show some quality issues, at some point you would think those two things would run into each other. Mm -hmm. The Department of Defense has to start looking at what is going on at Boeing. Mm -hmm. How can we really continue to trust this company with all of these billion-dollar contracts we're giving to them for all of these planes when they're struggling with something that should be a lot less technologically sophisticated, which is a passenger aircraft. Mm -hmm. So you have to think at some point, these two things have to intersect and start impacting Boeing at a bigger level. But what is it going to take? They've already crashed two planes. Yeah. I mean, and this was, this was another one where, you know, Anne has been saying it the last couple of stories, this could have been so much worse. Mm -hmm. If they were even just a little bit higher in the air, this would have been an absolute tragedy. Yeah. Because people would have been walking, uh, walking about the cabin. Um, Jesse, who's watching us live, it's always good to hear from you, Jesse. She said, I've watched many vid- videos of people on that plane and it's absolutely, well, she says, all caps, wild. Phones were sucked out of people's hands. So happy that people were still in takeoff. So everyone was seated and buckled. How much is someone's life worth to them? I mean, that's a really good question to ask. Um, Jesse, Joe, who's watching us live, just says scary. Agreed, Joe. Terrifying. And, uh, to your point, Jeff, I thought that was a key detail as well. Like, um, almost just incredibly tragic. And when you talk about the size of Alaska Airlines, though, I mean, they are so. According to Wikipedia, they are fifth. They were fifth last year in terms of total passengers carried. So it's like you have the majors like America, uh, American, Delta, Southwest, and United, and then it's Alaska Airlines above, like JetBlue, Spirit, and uh, Frontier, a bunch of other ones. So. They are kind of... They're a mid-major. Yeah. I mean, but they're also... Jeff's not impressed. <clears throat> but I mean, but, but think about it, Anna, to your point, right? Mm-hmm. Like, these lights go off and they make the calculated error of flying even though this light's going off, right? Where are they now? They've canceled... They canceled all of their flights through Saturday. Mm-hmm. Um, more cancellations are going to come just because there's no way all of this gets figured out by Saturday. And uh, so many of their planes were grounded... Sometimes that, I mean, Jeff, how often do we talk about uh, risk management and risk mitigation in terms of you need to think about these scenarios as to like, okay, if a, if a maintenance problem comes up, like in terms of what's the cost of actually grounding this one plane and figuring it out versus every flight being grounded? No, I think there's parallels actually to a lot of stuff, a lot of coverage we've been doing on cyber attacks. Yeah. I mean, it's all about nobody wants to invest the money to make sure your networks and your every all your OT systems are secure because, well, who's going to hit us? Yeah. Well, then you do get hit and you do get shut down or you do get ransomed. And then you're wondering why you didn't take those extra steps to try to be secure. That's what Alaska Airlines is dealing with right now with all those flight cancellations. Um, 
the investigators won't be able to hear what happened in the cockpit during the flight. Uh, I don't know if you guys noticed this as well, but so the black box recorded over all the flight sounds, which was on like a two hour loop. Mm -hmm. I mean, I feel like the first thing I ever learned about airplanes when I was a kid was that they had these black boxes to record things and they seem to always go wrong and not work. How is that not, how is that not improved? Like, I mean, we're talking about like, Things as simple as a boat. Well, not as simple as a boat, like a 63 pound, whatever. Um, but also, I, I feel like the black box should have come a little bit further uh, to the point where it can record everything from the events and not have something as simple as, oh, no, it just recorded over it. Like, that's a problem that hasn't existed <laughs> in any other technology for what, 20 years? Okay, but isn't it weird that every, like, security camera is, like, that always happens? They're like, well, we normally, you know, we have security cameras, but they re-record oh. over, and the footage is so grainy that you can't even see it. And Oh, like, gotcha. Just, like, see, none of that stuff ever works. I thought you were, see, I thought you were going a little bit more conspiracy theory here, where it's just like, isn't it funny that it's not available? Is no, it I, is no, it I intentionally no. not available? No. No? It's, yeah, and you know what? Uh, uh now that you mentioned the 401k, David, let's Don't talk more about even. that Don't scam. You even. Yeah. Uh, let's put our money somewhere where it might not be ever again because things happen. Put it in a coffee can. Bury it in your backyard. Hey, don't go digging around in my backyard. Mm -hmm. Don't go digging around. You know what? It's not always money I put in those coffee cans. I put other surprises in there as well just to throw people off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like the Gatorade bottles? <sighs> that Gatorade bottle. Gross. Mm-hmm. Staying out of your yard. I mean, but I mean, my fence, it looks good. It looks good. I mean, sometimes you got to take one <laughs> <laughs> just to get a quality fence at a decent rate. Um, all right. Our next most popular story this week, Hyperloop One shuts down. Family and friends, I welcome you into this gathering, which is made sacred with the spirit of love and friendship you bring to this gathering. Hyperloop One was a transportation technology startup that focused on the tube technology. The company wanted to commercialize high-speed travel through tube-encased lines, but alas, tubes no more. Hyperloop One is shut down. According to Bloomberg, the company has laid off more of its employees with the rest that were out as of December 31st. And it's trying to sell its remaining assets, including machinery and its test track. Hyperloop is going to transfer its IP to DP World, a logistics company that had a majority stake in the startup. At one time, Hyperloop One, previously known as Hyperloop Technologies, previously known as Virgin Hyperloop One, employed over 200 people. The startup had raised more than $450 million, including cash from the coffers of Virgin Group founder Richard Branson. And they had constructed a test track near Las Vegas. However, the company couldn't secure a contract to build an operating Hyperloop. The startup also lost Virgin's branding when it began to focus on cargo transportation over passenger, over passenger travel. Rest in pieces, Hyperloop One. We hardly knew ye. Anna, we just didn't see this one coming with the Hyperloop, did we? We didn't, no. Actually, we did. Yeah. But it was a very eloquent obituary that you just wrote for Hyperloop. Yep. Um, Thank, thank you so, very much. Yeah, thank wipe you. away some tears over here. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> yeah, we we knew that th there were tremendous challenges facing this concept, um, and new transportation infrastructure is never easy. Uh, first of all, um, Hyperloop Tech was losing ground to high speed rail, mm -hmm. and I think investors and governments are probably happy to give up a little speed for something that already has existing regulatory standards and safety baselines in place. Um, just a little further along. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. Secondly, the engineering behind this is no joke. Um, one expert cited by the American Society of Civil Engineers um, earlier this past fall uh, contends that maintaining an air vacuum in a tube for hundreds of kilometers is quite difficult in reality. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it takes a lot of energy to depressurize the tube. He added that these are engineering challenges that still need to be worked out. So um, maybe Hyperloop... Uh, is not has not made the kind of progress that um, everyone had hoped that it would at this point. Um, and I would say, too, like also from a consumer standpoint, um, uh, there are years of revenue list tests and, um, you know, that kind of thing in the future before 
anybody would use this. Yeah. Like there's a lot, there's a lot of runway here of like uh, not making money and just trying it out. Um, the national, the national Institute of health estimates that 12% of the population is claustrophobic also. Um, so <laughs> without any like consumer travel, cause I know that like initially that was the idea and they kind of, as you said, shifted towards uh, doing cargo. Mm -hmm. But if you're just looking at freight also, um, uh, you're not getting very much buy-in where there are just a handful of routes available. Like you would really need to like build yeah. this out yeah. because without mass adoption, like you have a hell of a last mile problem. And I don't, I just don't <laughs> see that. Like why, why make that switch yeah. when there are enough supply chain headaches out there? Like there's already so much logistics infrastructure available to you. And this one would not work very effectively. I yeah. just, it, if if there was like a need that would justify the very, very long test and development cycle and all of the money that this would take, sure. But yeah. there really isn't. And I don't think people really want to get in that thing. I certainly do not. You're one of the 12%. Um, I, but I'm not, though. And I still don't want to get in it. So I don't, I don't <laughs> think that it's just a 12%. Yeah. I think that's like a starting point. And then there's probably like a whole nother 50 that are just like, mm, you know, the pressure tube is not... I'm just yeah. not feeling great about that. I mean, we see difficulties when it comes to a proof of concept with small wearables and other consumer devices. So, you know, a proof of concept that takes real buy-in mm -hmm. infrastructure. I understand how people want to stay away from that. I know that I was championing it because I think that I think what they were hoping for was one place. I think they were hoping maybe even in like uh, a nation like Saudi Arabia, a place with <clears throat> sort of like endless coffers, you know, where uh, they could prove the technology and then maybe um, figure it out from there. But they just got nobody, nobody to buy into it. Well, weren't they looking initially like L.A. to Vegas or something like that? I, I, I think, think so. Was boring, wasn't it? I, well, because boring started as a result of Hyperloop One because they're like, oh, if we're going to have tube technology, we're going to need – you know, tunnels. Space. Yeah. It was like a St. Louis to Kansas City or something idea. And then there was a Texas one. And then in Texas, they opted instead to go with high speed rail. Mm -hmm. And then the one in Kansas, I don't know. I'll have to look that one up. But, but again, like, you know, you have what, three of these? <laughs> like, yeah. well, who's using them? I just, <laughs> well, that's, that's what I'm saying is like, maybe if they could have found something at a port or, I mean, I'm, I'm just, I'm thinking like, if they could have had someone buy in that had the resources and they could prove the proof of concept, maybe. But we always knew this was a long shot. And Jeff, I just feel like this company had nine lives. I, I mean, it is shocking how long it continued with basically a real short test track in Vegas and nothing else but investment from uh, Branson. Branson. Yeah, I mean, it was yeah <laughs> tough, tough audience here in the U.S. for something like this, too, for two reasons. I mean, first of all, and it's interesting, I didn't realize this, but the U.S. actually has the longest or most miles of rail in the world. Okay. But we have the 10th most passengers actually using rail uh -huh. to get around. So, I mean, right there, when you're looking at somebody changing that dynamic that they're used to, even if it's driving, flying, whatever the case is, getting on a bus... That was a tough sell right there. Yeah. Well, remember one of the concepts where there were these little carts that you just drive your car yeah. onto and then it takes you. Yeah. Yeah. It's meeting them in the middle. Yeah. The other thing was this cost between eight and 12 times more per mile than like even high speed rail. Yeah. So when you're looking at all of those realities, this never really had a shot in my yeah. opinion. Um, it was interesting. It was fun to think about, fun to talk about. I think it's interesting that as soon as they started looking more in my opinion, practical, like mm -hmm. with cargo, Virgin's like, nope. Oh, yeah. Interesting. Virgin's mm -hmm. in there for the <clears throat> sex appeal. Yeah. They're out of there now. Huh? Yeah. Well, you have to give Branson some credit, though. I mean, he he cut bait here. Mm -hmm. He did the same thing with Virgin Orbit. Yeah. Um, Virgin that, Galactic? No, no Virgin Galactic, Orbit. Yeah, Galactic's Galactic. still going. Orbit yeah. is what he dropped out of. That was for launching satellites and everything else. So he is a billionaire who's like, you know, I'll take this crazy so far, and then I'm out. <laughs> and that's kind of right. what happened here. Uh, it's uh, just a monster write up. There's still hope, though, both of you, in this Hyperloop game. Because, I mean, while we heard about Hyperloop 1 a lot, there's still 
Heart Global Mobility in the Netherlands, which recently won the mm. SpaceX Hyperloop competition. There's TransPod in Canada. There's Hyperloop transportation technologies here in the U.S. There's Novomo in Poland and something called Zelleros in Spain. That's just a handful of many operations that are out there. But one thing I will say is that a lot of these seem to be on the very early R&D stages as well. It seemed like Hyperloop One was trying to push something forward so fast that A, a lot of people weren't looking for, and B, like nobody was willing to buy into. And it's also crazy to me that all this happened as a result of like a white paper that Elon Musk published. I know. <clears throat> you know, it's just like, is it just that everyone- it's back, it's back before we knew. Well, I mean, I mean, yeah, it was back in a time where it's like, everything this man touches is gold, green light it. I mean, is it that simple? Probably. Yeah. I, so I haven't lost, like, and there are some, some of these companies are working on like uh, hybrids of um, Hyperloop technology. So I do think it's something that might still be in our transportation future way down the line. Mm -hmm. It's just not, it's just not ready for prime time yet. It's not anywhere near close. It's no, <laughs> nobody wants any part of it. But why? This, so then, like, when it comes to this type of money, okay, half a billion dollars thrown at something like this that was a pipe dream to begin with. I mean, what if we plug that into like grid infrastructure or something a whole lot less sexy, yeah. but really would have an impact? That's Warren Buffett. That's a Warren Buffett play. That's not a Richard Branson play. I know, but that's what I'm saying with a lot of these different technologies where we talk about transportation, okay? And we want to improve mobility and make it, what's the real goal here? Yeah. It's to make it faster, get there faster, get there quicker, as opposed to doing things to lay the groundwork to help us get there in a more, I would say, efficient manner when it comes yeah. to energy and, and everything else. Some people just don't want to block and tackle, Jeff. I know. <laughs> I know. Jeff heavy sigh. Oh man, there's nothing worse than the Jeff heavy sigh. Just like it immediately brings it down. Like, man, he's upset. Like two and one. Man, mm -hmm. it was. <clears throat> Producer Eric says it's two and one. It's two heavy sighs. Well, our most popular story this week: PepsiCo products being pulled over price hikes. Carrefour is a global supermarket. The company made the dramatic choice to stop selling PepsiCo products in France, Belgium, Spain, and Italy over price increases for soda, Lay's potato chips, Quaker oats, and even Lipton tea. The French grocery chain pulled the products and put up signs that said, we no longer sell this product due to unacceptable price increases. If the ban continues, it could be drastic. Carrefour has 12,225 stores in more than 30 countries. PepsiCo says it has, quote, been in discussion with Carrefour for many months and will continue to engage in good faith in order to try to ensure that our products are available. PepsiCo has raised prices by double-digit percentages for seven straight quarters, most recently hiking by 11% in the July to September period. The company has also been shrinking package sizes to meet consumer demand for convenience and portion control. <laughs> demand right. for convenience. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If only I, it were smaller. It's too big for my hands. Yes. I demand tinier bags of chips. <laughs> PepsiCo chief financial officer Hugh Johnston told investors, I do think that we see the consumer right now being a little more selective. Anna, maybe the consumer is being more selective because it costs Three times as much to have a tinier bag of chips that is still half full. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And soda and things like that are already more expensive in Europe, by the way. So it's like, I don't, I don't know what this, what their costs really are at this point, but it does seem like, like maybe it is. Uh, Dude, it's fired up. This is the third thing that gets them going. Yeah. Right. Mess with my chips. <laughs> Bring Sorry. back the regular bag. Yeah. And there's too much air in it. <laughs> I know it's just a setting. Just. Put the regular bag setting on. Just switch it over. How come they can put so many tortilla chips in a bag, but mm -hmm. only like half as many potato chips? Filled to the top. Oh, it's because they settled in shipping, Anna. Okay. Yeah, they settled in shipping. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> nice. I digress about <laughs> tortilla chips. Um, it's. Uh, it seems like it might be pushback time. I don't know. I read a report recently about a study that was undertaken by a think tank that tried to get at whether the price hikes that have come about um, in the past two years, uh, are the ones that are being blamed on inflation and material cost pressures, were actually in line with those pressures. And what they determined was that, by and large, corporations were taking this as an opportunity to raise their prices at a much higher rate than they needed to 
to counteract their own cost increases. So in a report on this, Fortune said that a joint study by think tanks IPPR and Commonwealth found profiteering, their word, by some of the world's biggest companies forced prices up significantly higher than cost during 2022. Uh, they largely blame what they refer to as greedflation. Ooh, uh, a new one. You like that one? Profiteering and greedflation. Write it down. <laughs> um, they're blaming this on some 1,300 public companies that they say are responsible for 90% of profit increases and are largely represented by oil companies and food producers. Now, do they have a right to do that? Of 100%. Co- of course mm-hmm. they do. But there may be consequences to that. And if you think that companies might be getting a little bit greedy here, you could be right about that. Mm -hmm. Um, And when a retailer takes such a public stance on something like this, um, going to bat against a multinational like PepsiCo, you kind of wonder if others might be emboldened to do the same at some point here and just say enough is enough. Maybe that rubs you the wrong way. Uh, Up to you, but... The buying public is always free to stop buying um, if the price gets too high. But that logic also applies to the retailer Mm -hmm. (laughs) because Mm -hmm. that's a cost to them, too. And if they don't want to do it, they don't have to. No, I mean, we've talked about it. It was the uh, the Yingling story uh, a while ago. Right. In terms of picking and choosing what is on your shelf. And uh, Jesse would like to know if that was your Jerry Seinfeld impression. Oh, which one? You do that. You do that frequently. The one where you go, I don't know. (laughs) What are we going to do now? (laughs) Well, I mean, but Anna, one thing that I 100% agree with you with is that it's on consumers to decide. And I feel like that's where Jeff's coming in, where it's like, hey, you can charge whatever you want. And if people keep buying it, that's on them. But but, but, but my point also is that it is also on retailers to decide if they want. I mean, they don't have to carry those products. No, completely. A cost to them, too. If it's too expensive, they don't have to. Completely agree. And oh, that's what I was talking about with the Yingling story. What if consumers want them to? See, we just get trapped in this vicious cycle. I mean, then, then they'll, then they'll, I guess, put them back eventually. Yeah. But you know, that's the consequence. They're they're free to do that. Uh, Doug Hatch, I think, is saying the difference between natural mark. Oh, is it natural marking marketing as a result of profit maximization? Is this kind of like a all news is good news sort of thing? Like Pepsi wants to anger an entire continent so that way it gets more press. <laughs> No, Pepsi isn't angering a continent. I think this this retailer is making an interesting choice. Mm-hmm. And you would hope it's based on what their customers are telling them. Okay. So when you look at these national brands, okay, versus what I would call a generic or a store brand, the margins uniformly are about the same in mm-hmm. terms of what they're going to make. If they're making 25 cents on one, or excuse me, if they're making 10% margin on one, they're going to do the same on the other. What the store's making. Correct. Okay. So if that Cheetos bag sells for six bucks, they're making 60 cents. If the generic or store brand sells for 350 as a replacement, they're making 35 cents. So somewhere along the lines, they need to make that up in volume, mm-hmm. ideally, which is interesting. So I pulled some stats here from the Private Label Manufacturers Association. They said in 2022, store brand values rose 11.3%, whereas the national brands rose at about 6%. So again, when we look at that discrepancy in the prices, that potentially is where a retailer, like these guys, could see that difference. Mm-hmm. If they're going to sell twice as much of something, they can get away with it. Yeah. It really does depend on the consumer. The other thing they found out is that annual store brand dollar volume increased by $23 billion. That was a new record in wow. 2022. So the consumer is saying, in a lot of instances, I'll take the off-brand because I can get more of it potentially. I'll buy two of them yeah. as opposed to the one. The other thing they found is that store brand um, – oh, what was the other one? Oh, One out of five food or non-food grocery products sold across the U.S. carries a retailer's name or store brand. So basically, these generics are very prominent. And if that's what this this, um, grocery store chain is going to do, good luck. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I think Mm -hmm. that's that's fine. And again, as long as they're listening to their consumer, they're not putting themselves in a bad place simply because they got pissed off about price increases, which, by the way, nobody likes to talk about this. But a lot of these price increases are coming from increased labor costs. They increased workers' pay. Fuel uh, prices are up, so it costs more to ship products than it ever has before. So there are other costs that these manufacturers are accruing that do lead to some of these price increases. Some of them. How do, yeah. Some just of them. How, how do those, whatever yeah. other non-capitalistic fabricated word you want to throw out there. Uh, I mean, it but seems the, the study the study does point out that that yes that there are like real hard numbers driving price increases for the suppliers. What their point is is that the increase in their prices now 
are much higher and that their corporate profits have been much higher if you look at the publicly available data then they needed to be to counteract those. So it's they're they're cushioning them their increases a little bit here. That's all. I mean, I think what the study says is the getting is good and they're gonna get it as much as they can until people completely refuse. And they've got another option if they want to. It's <laughs> just um I mean has your uh spending habits changed? I mean, okay, for store brands, other than eye drops, other than eye yeah. drops, everyone, PSA. <laughs> but I mean there are some things. Yeah. So this is a this is a weird one because like Cheetos are a thing in our house. Yeah. Like we buy Cheetos. Yeah. I could not bring home the store equivalent, the yeah. store brand equivalent. It just would girls? not work. Super cheesy girls. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> could not do that. Yeah. Uh, that would not work. I forget what store brand item I did bring home and they just they were just over it. Like yeah. it just could not happen again. I forget what it was. There's a store. To me, potato chips are potato chips, but. Yeah. yeah. Well, there are, and I mean, there are some things you got to look at uh, when you're looking at store brand, like pretzels and well, pretzels in particular, like uh, you gotta, you gotta watch those sodium counts because uh, I bought some store brand dots and uh, this guy. I like one in sodium. Shock. Yeah. In candy? No, no, no. Not in candy. Sorry. Oh, Dots. Dots Oh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Dots pretzels. I gotcha. Uh, Yeah. They were off brand. I'm like, oh, they're flavored. They're delicious. And they're probably good for me because they're pretzels. Then I looked at the back and I'm like, I think I'm going to die now because I ate. Well, I had more than because Dots has all that wonderful seasoning out there. I know. Well, and so they like double down on the generic sometimes in terms of salt and seasoning. And I'm just like, ooh, okay. Um, But I mean, my, my spending has definitely increased when it comes to store brands. Hands down. Like, I mean, it's just the reality of our food budget. Everything has gotten so out of control that the only time I really buy name brand stuff is when you have the people over and you're just like, I'll only eat J's. And you're just like, all right, I got to, you know. J's? J's, yeah. That's your high end? I mean, that's not my high end, but it's like, that's like my one example that I had off the top of my head of somebody who just is very brand loyal. Like a father-in-law. He's actually really cool. But, you know, got to have the J's. That's like an old school Wisconsin thing, I feel like. Jay's yeah. gotta have Jay's potato chips. Okay. Um, and when we're talking about packaging sizes, when all of this started, and I might have even shared this before on the podcast, but uh, I remember um, Roundies, which is like uh, one of Kroger's brands, or gener- actually, I don't know if it's their specific, but you know, uh, one of the store brands of pretzels didn't even like they were still running the old packaging sizes. On the new packaging sizes. So, and they just blatantly cut them right in half. Like, uh, and I was just like, it was, they were like honey braids. And I'm like, oh, is this some sort of packaging error? And they're like, nope. <laughs> just like, they're just running the old packaging out in the new sizes until uh, they kind of caught up. And I was just like, oh, okay. That's just, uh, that's on me. And um, I'm not, I'm not going to buy them because it looks incredibly unprofessional. Um Prices for food and non-alcoholic drinks were up 17.5% in the 20-country uh, euro area in March and were still up by 6.9% in November year over year. Uh, Anna, you had mentioned that some of the things specifically that uh, PepsiCo has pointed to, higher costs for grain and cooking oil, uh, playing into those raising prices, especially after Russia's invasion in Ukraine. Um, and I mean, that's still being felt by families and supermarkets. Uh, Doug says one of his favorite, one of my store brand cereals used to be one ninety nine forever. Now post pandemic, two ninety nine. It's garbage, Doug. It's garbage. Uh, and in horrible, horrible, horrible news, uh, loyal, loyal listener Amanda has alerted us that there's a snow day tomorrow, and so the logistics of our days have trained ch- just changed dramatically, Anna. Yeah, so, my I'm, Apple Watch, the school number came up on it, and then so I knew. <clears throat> oh I was like, God. this is it. I got snow It's our day. second snow day of the week, so it's not that we're monsters. It's just that we just had Christmas break, so it's like. Yeah, I, I, family I, enough already. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> my kids, like, want to be at school. They don't want to yeah, hang out with me anymore. They want to see their friends, you yeah. know? Just, uh, but, okay, so, we'll like, this, this is a historic episode between, like, live snow day notification on top of a 401k and madness. You should really spend tomorrow looking at your portfolio. No, I don't even. Those come and I shred them. Because I'm just like, oh, here's where all the money is I'll never have. All right. (laughs) 
<laughs> before. The before. views expressed by David Manti yes. are not those shared by other members not of reflective industrial of the media panel, please. or the Today Manufacturing Podcast. Because they're not right. All right. Our, uh, before we move on to, in case you missed it, uh, we have another word from our sponsor. To build a scalable maintenance function in today's market, organizations need to drive increased input or increased output from their equipment and their facilities with fewer resources. But there's one problem. Maintenance 1.0 needs to get with it. They got to evolve. So you got to join us Thursday, January 25th at 1 p.m. Eastern so you can learn about building your 2024 maintenance program. We're going to give you four key principles to boost up time now and for the future. Learn which maintenance strategies you can leverage to boost up time and why software data and technology are essential to the future of maintenance. Also, just a reminder that if you want to be a sponsor of the Today in Manufacturing podcast, help us keep this thing rolling. Reach out to Jeff, David, or Anna at IN.com with Sponsor the Podcast. We'll make sure you get hooked up real nice. All right. In case you missed it, stories maybe not as popular uh, on our websites, but stand to make a big impact on the industry going forward. Um, I'll go first this week. I chose a story that I worked on uh, on a self-eating rocket <clears throat> engine that burns the fuselage for fuel. It's incredible. University of Glasgow engineers have designed, developed, and fired the Erebus 3, the first unsupported autophage rocket engine that eats parts of its own body for fuel. Kind of Weird cannibalistic angle Cannibal on this rocket. one. Mm -hmm. Cannibal rocket. Oh, what a miss on the headline. Where were you, Jeff? Cannibal rocket fires. That's why it's in case you missed it. The engine uses waste heat from combustion to melt its own plastic fuselage as it fires. The hope is that this rocket engine can fly far beyond the Earth's atmosphere. The molten plastic is fed into the engine's combustion chamber as additional fuel that burns alongside onboard liquid propellants. The engineers demonstrated that the plastic fuselage can withstand the forces required to feed it into the engine without buckling, which is a critical step in making the concept viable. With this technology, spacecraft would need less propellant in onboard tanks, which means the craft can be lighter or have additional payload on board. So there are a number of reasons that I chose this story. The first of all is that it is really cool and incredible, and it just solves a lot of problems, potentially. Uh, one, one reason I chose it, consuming the fuselage would help stem our growing space junk problem. Mm -hmm. And I know that people hear space junk <clears throat> or uh, junkyards in the sky, and they think that people are exaggerating, but it's a real problem that actually yeah. threatens a lot of these launches. So there's a real solution there. The other reason I chose the story is that the idea is nearly 100 years old. It was first proposed and patented in 1938, but didn't really see any real movement until 2018. And that's what makes me excited about some of these stories and the stories that recover more on the R&D side in academia, where we might not even see it in our lifetimes. But there's a reason why like, I kind of get excited by it, because I'm just like, man, other than the tube technology... <laughs> You know, that might take another 100 years. Well, now the team is looking to scale up these propulsion systems to support the additional thrust required to make the design function as a rocket. The team is focused on refining the design toward an eventual test flight, but they're unable to put a specific time frame on a potential lost <clears throat> launch. They're also not commercializing the technology anytime <laughs> soon. I reached out and I was like, okay, when are you spinning it out? And they're just like, no, we're going to work on it. <laughs> The other reason that I chose the story was that if I encourage you to watch the video because they kept the entire test in it, right? Where they're firing it successfully. They're firing it while it eats. They're firing it while they pulse and throttle. And then they keep the, they keep the camera rolling when it makes mm -hmm. it just to the end and explodes. <laughs> Sounds awesome, actually. Yeah. And it just, you know, it's a... Uh, we had a bunch of people that commented online about how they appreciate that, you know, sometimes, you know, a person's ego or, you know, not just ego. You don't want to necessarily show that your project, you want to be like, yeah, it works. Why did it cut out with like a little bit of rocket left to go? Don't worry about that. Don't worry about that <laughs> last 10% of the fuselage. And but so um, 
I chose this story for all those reasons. I don't know if you guys had a chance to check it out, but Jeff, I mean, this gives you a perfect opportunity to say the thing. And but we don't know what it's going to lead to yet. It's going to lead to rockets that eat themselves to go to Mars. Right. I think the only concern that I initially have when I'm looking at this is you still need to be able to actually have something that doesn't get eaten. Within, yeah. You know, I mean, this is just the rocket, not the actual compartment that's carrying anything. Yeah. There's probably some safety concerns to, <laughs> to work out there. I would guess maybe um, is what's holding it back a little bit and yeah. figuring that part of it out. Yeah. Well, and I'm thinking more of like how we're talking about like if we're talking about uh, more fact finding or launching nano or micro satellites sure. deeper into space. Yeah, absolutely. But as far as the space junk thing, I mean, that's huge. That yeah. would be a huge um, resolution as well as the technology. I mean, one of the things like SpaceX is always focused on is bringing the rocket back safely as well as some of those other commercial um, satellite launchers. So it also eliminates that dynamic, which you would think would cut out a lot of cost, potentially help make those operations more efficient too. So. Yeah. Doug Hatch, again, thank you for watching us live, Doug. He says, talk about burning the candle at both ends, but it's more like a two-wicked candle. That That is burning the candle at yeah, both ends. I think, no, yeah. no, no, because like, just like, you know, those candles with like two wicks, oh. so they burn a little bit more evenly, the larger candles. That's more like that than burning it at both ends. So maybe, I mean, maybe Doug's got the solution here. We're splitting maybe hairs. Maybe that's what they need to do. We're splitting hairs here. What did Joe say? A little Joe, Joe said something. We're having, oh, rocket plus 8020 Mars. It's right, Joe. It's right. All right. Anna, what'd you think about this cannibal rocket? What a miss. Cannibal Sorry. rocket. Yeah. Cannibal rockets. Uh, I My question is about this um, rocket idea patented first in 1938. What was that? <laughs> I mean, it's it's crazy. I didn't look at the actual. Just like the made old out patent. of a soapbox or something. Like what? I, well, you know, I mean, like you just need you need the idea and the, s- the schematics. You know, you don't like to file the patent. You don't actually need like a working prototype. I mean, it makes the most sense, right? As opposed to having a fuel tank. Yeah, it would just you'd have the, you know it's like if it was made out of wood. I guess I don't know. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. yeah. So. I mean, but yeah, whoever did that, way ahead of their time. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's uh. I don't, I don't know. It's just, I thought it was a unique, con- well, I thought it was like such a new concept. Mm-hmm. And then you see that, that tidbit where it's just like, oh, no, no, someone, someone thought about this a long time ago. Yeah. And hopefully it's not a thing that leads to the thing because this is the only application that it can be used for really. <laughs> like your car, you run out of gas and it just starts to like. In a pinch. Well, I, I don't think you so. You wouldn't no. buy gas. You just yeah. buy this rocket. Yeah. So it yeah. Consumed itself. Well, I guess technically it would just be like, so maybe <laughs> if you were stranded, it would be the capability to like just have like a thermal event on one battery cell to get you the rest of the way home. Yeah, I guess so. I you guess you'd be able to stop it from burning. The parallel. Ignite it. You know, we'll work those out. Yeah. Work those details out. <laughs> um, but anyway, I thought this was a fascinating story. And the university actually reached out um, to give us kind of a heads up on this story. And it was one of those where like you just, I like, Checked it twice because I'm like, no, like I'm being had here. But it's uh, it's just a, <laughs> it's just a cool development. Uh, kind of like that 401k. You are being had. We're all being had. We're all being had. One day, when we all get ready to retire, Anna, we'll talk about it. And just check that account. Zero dollars. Mm-hmm, ah. mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Be all working at Kohl's. <laughs> just like I had to go back to work. <laughs> Uh, Anna, what's your in case you missed it this week? Never working at Kohl's. Why not? I bet the I bet it's got a banging employee discount. That's true. Mm-hmm. I can. It'll be like I'll get a deal on my like elastic jeans. <laughs> yeah, you will definitely be wearing elastic jeans by the time you retire. Definitely. <laughs> Uh, so I picked a space story also, a little bit different one though, no cannibals. Um, <laughs> in, in news that came as a little bit of a relief to me, NASA has announced that some, some delays to its Project Artemis mission. Uh, so the space agency had planned to send four astronauts around the moon later this year, but pushed the flight to September 2025. And then the first human mo- moon landing in 50 plus years also got bumped from 2025 to now 2026. Um, NASA cited safety concerns with its own spacecraft as well as development issues with the moon suits and landers coming from 
private industry. Mm. We've spoken about uh, this in recent podcasts, but SpaceX Starship Mega Rocket will be needed to get the first Artemis moonwalkers from lunar orbit down to the surface and then back up. But unfortunately, the two launch tests that SpaceX um, has under its belt have both resulted in explosions. Um, the next flight test is scheduled for February. But I think the last time we talked about this, we all were kind of in agreement that it was a little bit of a scary timeline, mm -hmm. uh, potentially rushing humans to the moon with this unproven new technology. Um, and if you think back to the Challenger and what a traumatic event that was for our entire nation, um, you know, imagine rushing astronauts to space and something similarly catastrophic were to take place. It would just be gutting. So. I don't know. There's just no reason to risk it, I think, in an attempt to prove a point that we're better than China and get to yeah. the moon first. Um, so I'm glad to see that they're going to put some more time um, into the test and development here. Uh, as Amit uh, Kastria, NASA's deputy associate administrator, pointed out, even with the delay, a 2026 moon landing represents, quote, a very aggressive schedule. Mm -hmm. So if you have to push it back again, NASA we're there for you. Please do that because <laughs> it's up to Elon Musk. He'd probably just be sending it tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. he would be there yesterday. And it, it just like there's no reason for that. Uh, there, it's not going to be good outcome if this technology is not absolutely perfect. So. So were these overly optimistic or aggressive timelines a result of, you know, public private partnerships with SpaceX? Like, you know, are these timelines that if it was so solely on NASA, never would have existed. I don't know. I mean, it's hard to know what those conversations were like if they were like, how quick can you get it done? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then yeah. they're like, because they want it done well, right the, away, you know, but the, the private suppliers here, are, we're going to give them timelines that help them get the contract. Not necessarily realistic for uh, a safe mission. Yeah. So you can see yeah. where there'd be a conflict right there, which is good to Anna's point, why NASA is stepping in. And I think that does set an interesting precedent moving forward. In terms of NASA working with more of these private companies to get stuff done that they're not going to sacrifice their standards, thank goodness, um, just for a timeline or yep. for headlines or whatever you want to say. Well, and I can't remember where I saw it, but there was the NASA engineer that came out and just, you know, very pointedly said, hey, we couldn't have these types of mistakes Well, like, that SpaceX is yeah. having. You know, it would have ruined NASA. So there, it was different just in terms of like how everything was calm and calculated to make sure that, you know, I mean, could you imagine if like some of those SpaceX failures were, you know, in-house NASA failures? It would mm -hmm. be, it would completely change everything as yeah. we knew it in and, terms of. And yes, I agree. And I think people will not necessarily make the distinction if this something bad were to go go wrong that's going to reflect poorly on nasa as well yeah when well, we ran that story this week too i know it was the united launch lines it was their rocket i forget the name of the private equity or the private <clears throat> company that was trying to do the, the lander the lunar lander on mars and had a lot of issues oh peregrine yeah, yeah. or no it's astrobotics peregrine craft no yeah just following that i got you know i give them a lot of credit though just in terms of like the constant updates. They said their team was up more than 24 hours. You know, they were letting people know, like, doesn't look good. <laughs> Does not look good. You know, normally people are like, oh, okay, we saw one or two things. We got a patch here. We got a patch there. They're just like, no, it's yeah. not. It is not good. It didn't turn on. Yeah. Uh, Doug likes to, <laughs> Doug says that Elon Musk just likes to say, you know, trust me. Yeah. It'll be fine. Trust me. We'll get you there. Jeff, what's your, in case you missed it this week? So, David, I was actually going to pick that story that you picked, so I had oh. to uh, scramble. So there's a life lesson. Be first, not third, when it comes to picking <laughs> stories. Here comes a really boring story from no, Jeff. No, it also... <laughs> All right, I'm done. See you guys Ooh, later. Yep, it just, we'll just keep it missed. My closing thought? <laughs> no, it actually gave me an opportunity... <laughs> to bring up another story, we ran. Um, we had a bunch of um, industry experts um, offer cybersecurity type predictions for 2024, and I wanted to read one of them because I thought it especially caught my attention. This was from Rick Jones. He's the CEO of Digital XRAD, which is a company that provides a lot of cybersecurity solutions, specifically for the industrial sector. And he talked about critical national infrastructure continuing to be the prize bullseye for cyber criminals and nation state actors alike. A whopping 90% of these industries have fallen prey to successful ransomware attacks in the past year, underscoring the urgent need for fortified defenses. Further ratcheting up tensions, nearly 80% of chief information security officers 
feel that we've crossed into an era of constant cyber warfare. I wanted to bring this up because this also comes right after a huge string of attacks in last fall that came from a group. It's a Russian group called the Cyber Avengers. I was telling Anna about this group before. And what they have found is a vulnerability in PLCs mm. used in water treatment facilities. Okay. Well, they're not just using water treatment facilities. They're also used in breweries. They're also used in food and beverage facilities. So when we talk about some of this critical national infrastructure, they're talking about water treatment there. It's the same technology used in manufacturing. So when we talk about a lot of these different trends that are coming up here, some of it's here already. It's yeah. just going to get bigger, and we're going to hear more of it. Therefore, putting, again, the onus on being as prepared as you possibly can. This is a three-part series. There's a lot of other stuff in there, too. A lot of talk about artificial intelligence, how it's going to be used for by the bad guys, but also for the good guys in a lot of positive ways. New legislation coming down the pike, as well as greater awareness and more conversations about cybersecurity that are going on within industrial organizations which are leading to more conversations, which is leading to more smarter investment. Not just trying to throw things out there, but really making intelligent decisions that can help minimize risk when it comes to cybersecurity, shutting down plants, being exposed to ransomware attacks, and all those things. So, um, yeah, I'd encourage you to take a look. Is it, So what is a CISO? Chief Information Security Officer. Are we seeing more of those or similar uh, people being hired on at manufacturers or is they've are we always, still, they've always been there, yeah. but it's always been on the it side. Okay. Now they realize we need to transition and focus on operational technology security as well. Yeah. And it's not a cut and paste situation just because that works for protecting personal data, human resources, information, um, intellectual property. That's not the same type of protections that we need when it comes to making sure somebody's not messing with the data on your, um, you know, filtration sensors. Okay. Are we getting, Anywhere close to where we need to be in terms of like protecting manufacturers there? Huge progress. Yeah. I would say in the last two years, there has been a so much more dialogue, so much more investment, more tools are available. We still know so much more about the um, attackers that are out there now because during the pandemic, manufacturing became such a prime target yeah. because mm -hmm. it was one of the few that was still up and <laughs> running and, yeah. and had money to, to pay out. So it's become a lot better. But as we you know, we've talked about this before. As we hook up more of this stuff, we become more connected, more sensors, more technology, more industry 4.0 stuff. That broadens the attack surface for the bad guys too. There's more ways for them to get at us, more endpoints that we need to secure. But we're getting smarter. A lot of suppliers, we talked to the big automation companies like Emerson and Rockwell and Siemens and all those folks. Them having a greater appreciation for what cybersecurity means, not just to them, but to their customers, is also playing a big role. No, I recently had a conversation <clears throat> with... Uh, one of the guys at Genetech, and he was talking about, you know, you talk about the hardware that they're hacking into um, and they're hacking into security cameras. Like yeah. people think like a security camera, what's going to be more secure than that? But I mean, it's actually quite vulnerable because it's just not designed into the hardware. Well, and in most cases, it's not the camera or the device. It's what the device is connected to and how they can snake their way in that way. Well, okay. So that was like the node or the entry point was yeah. like that connectivity yeah. In the camera. Um, Doug says, don't cyber attack our beer. <laughs> Jesse agrees. Not our happy juice. <sighs> I D agree. Doug wants to know, was there, do you have a brand of the PLC? It was uh, Unitronics. Oh, man. Yeah, that's my question is, do you think that manufacturers, uh, when they're in their purchasing departments, do they know what to look for in terms of like these companies have... From an equipment side, this figured out and these companies do not. So it's yes and no, right? I mean, that whole secure by design dynamic comes into play because if you're buying from a big automation provider or any really, you know, well-known supplier, you're assuming they've got a lot of those in embedded security protocols in place. And they usually do. Mm -hmm. But then you're connecting it to legacy equipment, legacy systems. So you need to make sure that that connection point is also True. On, on pace. And that's where that conversation needs to happen more often than it does as opposed to just making the assumption or just not wanting to deal with it because, you know, integration timelines are never fun to deal with. So it's, and that's why like a lot of the trends that were mentioned in the piece are talking about more conversation and the benefits that that'll produce in the coming year. So there is good news. Okay. Okay. That's good. I just I like to kind of bring it around a yep. little bit. Well done, David. Um, Anna, before we ask for your final thought, mm -hmm. uh, I just wanted to say like, so I opened up this NTSB report and it was a two year old, two year old child that was on board Jeez. that, uh, the Tremont and it was actually the captain and one of the mates kids. Oh, but I mean, I understand, scary. I understand bringing your kid to work, but like talk about 
making Oof. an emergency situation just, I mean, like legitimate worst nightmare situation right there. Mm-hmm. Um, my goodness. Um, yeah. So I guess actually, sorry that I clarified that. Yeah. Um, and actually, okay, before final thoughts, we do have our uh, contest. We didn't have a winner this week. We mm-hmm. did have a new question. The question was, which of these four industries spend the most on shop towels in the United States? We were looking for the top two. Uh, the industries were printing and publishing, auto repair services and parking, automotive dealers and service stations, industri- industrial machinery and equipment. Now, the shop towel industry, just in like North America, generates some five hundred million dollars in revenue. We had a couple of people get one, one right, none right. Uh, the top two are um, one is number one is printing and publishing, spent a hundred and five million dollars on shop towels this year or last year. Automotive dealers and service stations, eighty six million. Mm. That's a lot of shop towels. A lot of shop towels. Um, A note from our partners, uh, founded in 1985 and headquartered in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Sellers is a leading manufacturer of shop towels, uh, multi-use disposable wipers, towel and tissue and absorbent products. Sellers products, which are sold under the Toolbox, Clean Task, and Mayfair brands, are made from recycled and renewable materials, and they're high performance and good for the environment. I think we're going to put a pin in the trivia for a minute, too, just because I need to figure out something that is not that is more. I want to give these things away. Right. You know, and it's like I feel like we have a lot of wrong answers. So, I mean, I got to figure out a medium between the harder question and someone that just says first, you know, (laughs) just email us first. (laughs) So we'll figure that out and hopefully have a chance to bring the giveaway back soon. Let's move into our final thoughts. Anna, has your final thought changed as a result of the snow day notification? Uh, well, this was my original final thought, but it is related. Okay. So um, <clears throat> obviously we have a huge snowstorm coming tomorrow. And then after that, it's supposed to get really, really cold, mm. uh, which is really a bummer because snow is e- easier entertainment. And I don't think when it's zero degrees on Sunday or Monday – my kids are going to want to go outside, which should, makes sense. You still um, get. <sighs> anyway, I oh, just got mine. Yeah, it's yours is canceled. Yours is canceled. Everybody's canceled. Everybody's um, canceled. <clears throat> uh, Come on. So, but anyway, next weekend also is going to be bitterly cold here. So I need ideas for how to keep um, two six-year-olds and an eight-year-old busy inside. Uh, when we have been stuck inside for a while. Yeah. So please send me your ideas. I'm trying to come up with like some fun activities so everyone doesn't go bonkers. Initially, I was going to do the like snow food coloring thing, but it's going to be too cold, I think. So um, please. Just do like nano, nano outside time. (laughs) Just like. (laughs) For three minutes at a time. Yeah. You know how long it takes to put on snow pants? No, they just hang out inside. (laughs) It's like they get 10 minutes outside, they come in, they get like five minutes of tablet time, and then back outside. We're going to make it a game. Yeah. You know, first it's 10, 9, 8, we'll just work ourselves down. They would be like, we'll do it, but we get hot cocoa every time we come in. That's, mm-hmm. <laughs> that's mm-hmm. the level of negotiation that I would be facing. I don't think I had the energy to take them in and out of the clothes that much. That was just such a battle. Well, I know, yeah. and then the clothes are like soaked and you have to... Yeah. Put them in the dryer and then, uh, yeah, it's just, it's a lot of work. Well, one thing that's nice about when it's super cold is they won't, they, it won't, uh, they won't get soaked. That's true. Like, you know, it was dry, a really dry wet, snow. Yeah. Yeah. It was a really wet snow because it was the same thing. Like they come in and just the pile of clothes is so <laughs> heavy. <laughs> this is the advantage of having kids who ignore you until they need gas money. That's true. That's, you don't have to come up with any activities for Anna on uh, no tomorrow. Activities. She will probably fend for herself. Actually, yes. Yeah. Actually, what, you know, what are your kids doing tomorrow? Well, they're all of them actually. Um, college hasn't started for two of them, yeah. and the one has the day off with with high school. So oh, maybe we'll inquire to see if they need if they need stimulus to be busy. <laughs> <laughs> they can get around. Yeah, if they can get around. Um, <laughs> Nolan says uh, blanket fort for the for win. The win. What are you? Thank a, you. A hundred. For the win. For the win. 
Um, I, no, uh, so I thought it was going to be, he was supposed to travel to Dallas. And so I thought it was a typo about oh, going Fort to Worth. DFW <laughs> in Fort Worth. And so I'm like, okay, I got to really parse this out. Yeah, no, Blanket Fort for the win. Thank you. Thank yes, you good call, Nolan. Uh, blanket Forts uh, usually make an appearance at least once a week. We actually made a Blanket Fort this morning. Mm-hmm to dive into after school. Oh, nice. So we're halfway there. I, uh, one of the things that um, our kids did during the last snow day was they took every car out of the car drawers and buckets and lined them up upstairs. Mm-hmm. And we have enough cars to go from their room into our room and back. Oh, wow. It's a lot of cars. <laughs> But, you know, you get creative. You get creative when you get that cabin fever. Thank you, Nolan. Uh, He says, for the win, or FTW means for the win, BT dubs. And uh, BT dubs means, by the way, by the way. (laughs) Um, Nolan, you are a treasure. Nailed it, Nolan. Can we bar him from the podcast, please? He's a welcome welcome contributor. Welcome contributor. You're not going to let him trash talk David? (laughs) Jeff. I I think, like, that's what he's going to allow. Just that like, would have been fine, but now he's just being Nolan. <laughs> there was too much Nolan. Too much Nolan there. Um, my final thought is just <laughs> that uh, we have a critical blood shortage, and I know that I've brought it up multiple times on the podcast. But if you are able and you have the availability, please go and donate blood if you can. Um, just because, you know, want to make sure there's some there when we need it. Um, I mean, looks like I'll have time to do that tomorrow, but... <laughs> No way of going. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll snowshoe in. I'll snowshoe in, give blood, pass out for a while, have a cookie, it'll be fine. Uh, Jeff, your final thought this week. I think um, what I've realized is, now that I'm at a different point in my life than maybe you guys are with the kids stuff, like I've actually learned to embrace some of this winter stuff. Yeah. You know, I can appreciate the fact that we had such a mild December. I knew January was going to be terrible. Yeah. <clears throat> what do you but, think the groundhog's going to do, Jeff? Definitely going to, I don't know. It's diving back in. We're going to have winter forever. But the one positive is before, you know, when it gets to be like that 30, 40 degrees, it's a little sketchy to go fishing. Mm. I know I'll be able to go ice fishing now. I can look forward to that. That's true. With the really low temperatures, like I'm a pretty warm bodied person, warm blooded person. So like, but I love having the fireplace going. Oh yeah. So with the single digits, it does give me a chance to fire that up and enjoy that. So you're loving, you know, this. maybe it's your positive attitude on everything, David. It's rubbing off on the curmudgeon in me. Yes. I'm yep. Beginning to see mm-hmm. the glass sometimes can be helpful. See in the lights. See, look at that. I there like that. Go. I like it. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, before we get out of here, please make sure to like share. Oh, Doug says he's already donated double red at the last week of 2023. Nice. Doug's doing it. There you go. There you go, Doug. I went Saturday. Be like Doug. You did? I did. Man, I got to get in. I had, uh, my appointment was um, right in the middle of our break when the family was stricken with illness. So I'm like, I don't think anyone wants my blood right now. Probably so not. I, I got to get it was full of gin. I mean, you know, there's got to be some gin blood, you know. <laughs> aficionados out there gin blood type yeah they just uh what's your blood type gin gin yeah oh one of those oh man if they're just getting a transfusion and they're like this blood tastes like hendrix (laughs) (laughs) nah i know what's it been recently too far too far too far bring it back all right rain it in all right good job doug crushing it thanks more people be like doug and jeff um, all right. Please make sure to like, share, and subscribe to the podcast. You could also help us out a lot by leaving the podcast a positive review on whatever platform you use. If you want to email the podcast or sponsor the podcast, you can reach any of us at Jeff, David, or Anna at IN.com with email the podcast or sponsor the podcast in the subject line. You could also subscribe to our daily newsletter. Make sure you get it delivered to your inbox first and subscribe to us on YouTube at IN Magazine so you can join Doug, Jesse, and Seth. Everyone else, oh, and Nolan. Joe. Joe, Joe. Uh, Last time for Nolan, but. (laughs) Everyone that joins us for the live podcast, we really do appreciate your contributions. All right, for Jeff Ranke and Anna Wells, I'm David Manti. This is the Today in Manufacturing podcast. We'll see you next week.